All right, guys. Um, morning. Hey, if you got your Bible, go to Matthew 7. We're back in our Matthew series here. We're going to jump right back in. And we're in Matthew 7. We're going to look at verses 7 through 11 today. So if you're using one of those few Bibles, that is page 812. So Matthew 7, verses um, 7 through 11. Uh, as, um, before we read here, let me tell you a quick story here. So in, in Latin America, there is a tradition. Thanks, Bill. It's a tradition called the quinceañera. Anybody ever heard of this? A couple, couple of you. Well, this, this tradition is when a young girl turns 15 years old. And um, this seems to be uh, the, the cultural and traditional moment when they believe that she goes from being just a girl and she becomes a woman. And um, families literally throw these epic parties for these girls. Um, it's, you know, this is an Anglo culture, and it's a little hard to really explain what these parties are like. Um, um, you know, just to kind of give you an idea of this, my brother got married about seven years ago, and... Um, he asked me to perform the ceremony for him and his, or my sister-in-law. And the ceremony started at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And then I was done with the ceremony, maybe by 2 o'clock, an hour long or whatever. Well, we, we didn't leave. The, the party didn't end till the next morning. Breakfast was brought in for the guests that were still there. I mean, this is, I mean, this is the kind of party that is just normal. It's, it's really hard to explain if you've ne- never been to... A Latino party, and I have been in the U.S. for quite some time time now, so I'm a little more tame than most. <laughs> but 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 these parties are epic, and when I was a teenager, we I mean it was stupid, but but we made it. My friends and we made it our mission to attend as many of these parties as we possibly could. <laughs> and the reason the reason was really ridiculous, but we we felt and we thought that. The more parties we were invited, the more of these you know, events we attended, the cooler we were. So whenever we got invited, you know, we were just over the moon. And when we weren't sure if we were going to be on the list, we had issues. You know? We had to have interventions. So our, our friends, we would we'd get together and we would try to figure out who knew the birthday girl better or who knew the friends best so we could try to convince the birthday girl to get us on the list so we could get the invitation. It was really dumb. But but these invitations, really, I mean, it's, again, all we could think about is we need to get invited to this party because they were just so good. And uh, these invitations were just so special, so important to us that we would literally would do anything it took to get one of these invitations. Well, what is the greatest invitation that you've ever received? It could be a wedding, it could be a birthday. What is it? Well, today, as we look at Matthew 7, um, we're going to read about this invitation that Jesus makes to us, his children that literally is outside of this world unbelievable. But before, before we read it, I want you just to, to stop and consider for a moment that God, who is infinitely strong and He can do whatever He wants, that God who is infinitely righteous so that He always does what is right, that God who is perfectly good so that everything he does is good and that God who is perfectly wise so that he always knows what is right and good and that God who is infinitely and perfectly loving so that everything he does is for our good when you pause to think about that when God invites us his children to ask him for good things with the promise that he will give them to us, it's just incredible. What an invitation. So 
We're going to read our text, so if you can, stand with me. Uh, we're going to read and then we're going to pray. We're going to, we stand because we want to honor God's Word. So let's, um, let's read Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. And it says this, <clears throat> Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you? If his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone. Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good gifts to those who ask him? Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your word. Your word is true. Your word is powerful. Your word is perfect. We treasure your words, God, and we pray today that you would speak. Lord, and I pray that you would be exalted and glorified, God. I pray that you would meet us, God, and pray for help. Help me to faithfully, clearly communicate your word and the gospel of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me say this here, you guys, as as a confession. If I can be completely honest with you, prayer has always been an area of growth for me. Just always has been. It's much easier for me to, um, to to read the Bible or to study a text or to really try to. But I've always, prayer has always been an area that that I've I've needed to grow in. And so as I've been wrestling with this text, uh, the Lord really kind of has been. Um, you know, it's 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 a rough one. The Lord is kind of working in me and. And I think, too, that I, I might not be the only one that can say that in this room. And this, that, that, that I say what I just said, is, is really a tragedy. And I'm, I'm not trying to guilt trip us into checking off something from some task list to do. But it, it, it is just crazy to me that the, the greatest invitation in the world is extended to us and somehow, incomprehensibly, we regularly turn to other things. So what I've been praying personally for me, and what I've been praying for you and for us as a body, is that God would use this message, that God would use these words uh, from Jesus to awaken in us a new desire or um, a new inclination or a fresh inclination to pray. I'm going to say this here also at the beginning, and this is kind of what I would like to start, but, but, but life, and, and you might look at me and think, well, what, what do you know about life? You're, you're young. But life is full of perplexities and uncertainties and problems, and, and we know that that is true. Just live Live a little bit and you'll uh, encounter that. And, you know, there's all kinds of circumstances and moments, good and bad, you know, trials and victories and defeats and summits and valleys. And um, all of these will come and meet us at some point. And really what matters is not so much the variety of thing, things that will come and that we have to deal with, but what really matters more is how we deal with those things as they come. Hebrews 11, verse 8 says this, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to a place where he was to receive an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. One thing that has always intrigued me about the, um, the, the, the narrative of Abraham is that you, know, you, get, you get to... Genesis 12, and God speaks to this man. So the first few verses, verses 1 through 3, God speaks to Abraham and asks, commands him to go. And what does Abraham do? Verse 4, it says, it just says this, So Abraham left. 
You fast forward a few chapters, Genesis 22. Uh, decades have been passed after the promise. The son of promise is now born. And God says to Abraham, or he commands him, or asks him to take his son to be uh, offered as a sacrifice. And what does Abraham do? The Bible says, so Abraham left early in the morning. <laughs> Every time God spoke and Abraham responded and it, it is all it's it always been incredible to me that god speaks and abraham just immediately obeys and he leaves and an old puritan answers the question as to why was the patriarch able to do that and he says this abraham went out not knowing where he was going or where he went but he did know with whom he went he was not alone. He was on this journey with another, the one who does know everything, the one who has everything under control, the one who uh, will never leave us or forsake us, and the best traveling companion. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, and this should be on the screen here. It says this, The Lord does not promise to change life for us, he does not promise to remove difficulties and trials and problems and tribulations. He does not say that he is going to cut out all the thorns and leave the roses with their wonderful perfume. No, he faces life realistically and tells us that there are things to which the flesh is heir and which are bound to come. But he assures us that we can so know him. that Whatever happens, we need never be frightened. We need never to be alarmed. He puts all of this in this great and comprehensive promise. Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. He's always there. So what I'm going to do this morning is, is two things. First, I, I want us to look at the text, and I want us to look at eight encouragements to pray. And then I want to answer this question because we've got a challenge with this promise. So how should we understand this promise that uh, we will receive when we ask, we will find when we seek, and we're going to have the door opened when we knock? So eight encouragements to pray, and then we've got to address how should we view this promise? How should we understand this promise? Because uh, it's a challenge. So let's start. Eight encouragements to pray. Number one, if you're keeping notes, um, it's all going to be on the screen here. So number one, the first encouragement to pray, why we should have confidence, why should we uh, do this, is that Jesus, the Son of God, invites us to pray. Nobody else, but it's Christ himself inviting us to pray. And so Jesus three times invites us to pray, or really three times he commands us to pray, to ask him for what he needs. And it's the number of times, it's the repetition that really should get your attention. Look again at verses 7 and 8. It says this, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find knock and it will be open to you for everyone who asks receives the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be open so jesus says it in verse 7 and then verse 8 comes and he repeats what he just said again and the second time he says that it, it just comes a little bit stronger and the repetition is meant to say i mean this jesus is saying i mean this i want you to do this ask your father for what you need seek your father for help knock on the door of your father's house and he will open and give you what you need so ask seek and knock i invite you three times because what i really really want you to enjoy the help of your father so the first encouragement is that Jesus invites us to pray and he repeats it in a strong way and the repetition should say, I mean this. And if the Son of God means something, 
He means something, and you can hang your hat on that. The second encouragement to pray is this. Jesus, again, the Son of God, not only invites you to pray and commands you to pray, but He makes promises to you if you pray. So what's more amazing than the three invitations that He repeats are the seven promises you find in the text. Look again, verses 7 and 8. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. And then at the end of verse 11 it says this, How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Three invitations, seven promises. It will be given to you. You will find. It will be open to you. The asker receives, the seeker finds, the knocker gets an open door, and your Father will give you good things. And the point of these promises, again, is to say to us, His children, be encouraged to come. Pray to Him. It's not in vain that you pray. God is not messing with you. He listens and He answers. He gives good things when you pray. So be encouraged. Pray often. Pray regularly. And pray with confidence. So you've got three invitations, seven promises. Number three, and I, and, and I hope this makes sense, the third encouragement is that God makes Himself available at different levels. And let me try to explain what I mean by that. So Jesus encourages us, not just by the invitations and the promises, but it's the variety of invitations that also kind of should get our attention. In, In other words, God, your Father, stands ready to respond in a positive way when you find him at different levels of accessibility. Let me explain that. So ask, seek, and knock. And if, if a dad, if, if, if my son is present there with me, he can ask me for what he needs. If the dad is somewhere in the house but not seen, and the child or the, the son will go and look for the dad, and when he finds him, will ask him for what he needs. But if the child finds the dad behind uh, a closed door of a uh, you know, room or an office, the child will knock to get what he needs. So there's this element of persistency, but the point seems that it doesn't matter whether you find God immediately, close at hand, almost you can touch him with his nearness, or it's hard to see, and even with some barriers in between. Have you, have you ever felt that way? That it just doesn't, that, you know, there, there are moments when you, it just, it just, you feel like God is there, and then others that you can hardly even see him, or is he even there listening to me? Well, either way, he will hear you. And he will give you good things. Why? Because you looked to him and no other. So you've got the promises, the, the invitations. You've got the promises. And you've got God who is making himself accessible at different, in different ways. Whether, again, you feel like he is close at hand or whether he feels a million miles away. When we look to him and no other, God will hear and he will give us good things. The fourth encouragement to pray is this. Everyone who asks receives. So Jesus encourages us by making it explicit in the text that everyone who asks receives, not just some or a few, but everyone. Look at verse 8. Right there, second word, for everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. So when Jesus adds that word there, everyone, in verse 8, he wants to overcome our, um, our, our doubting, 
our shyness, our timidity and hesitancy that for some reason it might work for others, but not for me. Now, to be clear, Jesus is talking about the children of God here. Not all human beings. If we will not have Jesus as our Savior and God as our Father, these promises do not apply to you. And to become the child of God or a child of God, you must receive the Son Christ, who gives us the authority for adoption, as John 1, 12 says. Them, they are who these promises are for, the children of God. For those who receive Christ, every one of them who asks, receives good things from their Father. And the point is that none of the children are excluded. All are welcome to come. Martin Luther said this about uh, this idea, and this is in your bulletin. It's the quote that you find there. It says this, He knows that we are timid and shy, that we feel unworthy and unfit to present our needs to God. We think that God is so great and we are so tiny that we do not dare to pray. That is why Christ wants to lure us away from such timid thoughts, to remove our doubts and to have us go ahead confidently and boldly. Everyone who asks, receives. I was thinking about Mike Keller a few weeks ago when Dave talked about the Lord's Prayer, when he said that he just felt that God was busy with somebody else, you know. And I felt that way. But Jesus is promising everyone, every child who asks, receives. What a promise, you guys. So you've got invitations or commands. You've got promises. Then you've got the various levels that God is making himself accessible. Then you've got, listen, every child, no matter what you ask, will receive. The fifth encouragement is this, is that we are coming to our Father. When we come to God through Jesus, you are coming to your Father. Look at verse 11. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask Him? And the word Father was never, ever just a label for Jesus. It is one of the greatest truths. God is your Father, and the implication of this is that He will never, never, never give us what is bad. Ever. He is our Father. And this goes right into the sixth implication, because not only is He your Father, but look at what Jesus adds. Our Heavenly Father is better than your earthly Father. Jesus encourages us again to pray by showing you that your Father in heaven is better than our earthly Father and far more certainly will give good things to us than they they do or did. There's no evil in our heavenly Father like there is in us earthly fathers. Now this is very blunt, but true. Again, look at verse 11. If you then, look at right there, who are evil. Jesus could have used a whole bunch of other words. If you then who have issues, if you then who are weak, if you then who struggle, if you then who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts? Things to those who ask him. So we know and are aware, and Jesus was aware and knew for sure that us earthly fathers are sinful. And so he goes beyond just saying that you're coming to your father, and he says that God, the Father, is always better than our earthly father because we are evil and God is not. Again, very unflattering here. 
very blunt. And this is a clear instance in Jesus' belief on the universal sinfulness of man. We are evil. And the disciples who are in the crowd, Jesus assumes that they are evil as well. Again, he doesn't choose a softer word. He just says that his disciples in the crowd are also evil. Now, and let's insert parentheses here. Friends, don't ever limit your understanding of the fatherhood of God to your experience with your own earthly father. Rather, take heart that God, your father, has none of the sins or limitations or weaknesses or hang-ups of your earthly father. And the point that Jesus is making is this. Even earthly sinful fathers usually have enough common grace to give good things to their kids. Now, they are terribly abusive fathers, but in most places of the world, fathers are jealous for the good of their kids, even when they aren't sure what is good for them. But God is always better. In Him there is no evil. And so, the argument that Jesus is making is very strong. If your earthly father gave you good things, and even if he didn't, how much more will your heavenly father give you good things? Always give you good things to those who ask. So that is encouragement number six. And the first six encouragements are explicit in the text. The last two are implicit. So you follow with me here. The seventh encouragement is this. We can trust the goodness of God because he already made us his children. Let that just sink in for a second. God will give you good things as his son or daughter because he already gave you this gift of becoming a child of God. St. Augustine said this, For what would he not now give to sons when they ask? When he has already granted this very thing, namely that they might be sons. Being a son of God is a gift that we receive when we come to Christ and put our trust in Him. Jesus said to the Pharisees in John 8, 42, If God, if God were your Father, you would love me. But God is not their Father. They reject Jesus. So, not all are sons of God, but if God has freely made us sons, how much more will He give us what we need? And the last encouragement, again, this is implicit from the text, is that the cross is the foundation of prayer. In these words that Jesus is saying, implicitly we see the, found, the cross of Christ as the foundation and, uh, for all answers to our prayer. And the reason is this. He calls us evil, and yet he says what? We are also children of God. How can it be that evil people are adopted by a holy God? How can we presume to first be children, let alone ask and expect to receive and seek and expect to find and knock and expect the door to be opened? You know how? The cross. Jesus gives this answer several times in the Gospels. Look at Matthew 20, verse 28. He says this, The Son of Man came not to serve, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. He gave His life to ransom us from the wrath of God and then put us in the position of what? Children who only receive good things from our Father. 
And in Matthew 26, 28, the last supper, he said this, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. We're going to have communion in a little while, but because of the blood of Jesus, our sins can be forgiven when we trust in Him. And this is why, even though Jesus calls us evil, we can be the children of God and count on Him to give us good things when we ask. The death of Christ is the foundation for all the promises of God. And all the answers to prayer that we ever get. Now, when we pray, we always say in Jesus' name, and the reason is this, everything depends on Him. So you've got eight encouragements to pray, eight confidences or eight uh, reasons to pray, six explicit in the text, two uh, implicit. Now, there is, like I said, a, a challenge with this text, and it's a big question that we have to answer. And the question is this, how should we understand these promises? Does this mean that we will get, as children of God, everything we ask for? Does this mean that every time we ask for something, are we going to get it? And the context here is sufficient to answer this question. And we're going to unpack this just for a moment. No. We do not get everything we ask for. We should not get everything we ask for. And we would not want to get everything we ask for. (laughs) The reason I say that we should not is because, in a way, we would become like God if every time we ask for something, God gave it to us. We should not be God. God should be God. And the reason I say, you know, it, it's not like God is a genie in a bottle. He is the God of heaven. God is not Santa Claus. He is the God of heaven. The reason I say that we would not want everything we ask for is because then you and I would have to bear the burden of infinite wisdom, which we don't have. We just don't. We will never infallibly know how every decision, every want we get, every desire that comes up will affect every event in our life or in history for that matter. But really, the main reason is because the text implies this. Look at what Jesus said in verses 9 and 10. A good father will not give his child a stone if he asks for bread and will not give him a serpent if he asks for a fish. Now, this illustration should make you ask this question. Well, what if the child asks for the serpent? Or what if the child asks for the rock does the text answer whether the father in heaven will give it well yes it does verse 11 says this jesus pulls the truth from the illustration and says therefore how much more will your father give good things to those who ask him he only gives good things always good things he does not give serpents to kids or rocks to kids therefore the text itself points away from the conclusion that ask and you will receive means ask and you will receive the very thing you ask for when you ask for it the way you ask for it it doesn't say that and it doesn't mean that When you step back and you look at the passage as a whole, it says that when we ask, when we seek, when we knock, when we pray as needy children, looking away from ourselves and our resources and our understanding to our trustworthy Heavenly Father, He will hear and He will give you good things. Sometimes just what you ask for. Sometimes just when you ask for it. Sometimes just the way you desire. And other times he will give you something better. 
or at a time that he knows is better, or in a way that he knows is better. And this should test our faith. Because if we thought that something was better in the first place, we would have asked for that. But you're not God. We're not infinitely strong. We are not infinitely righteous or infinitely good or infinitely wise or loving. And so it is a great mercy to us, to the world, that we don't get everything we ask for. Now let me say something here that I probably should have started with. Uh, It should raise the question too to think why did Jesus say these words here on his sermon? There are there are some people who who believe that uh, the last little bit of Jesus' sermon there in Matthew seven was just kind of unconnected thoughts. So as Jesus, whenever something came to mind, he just said it. But really. When you study the text, this is really a terrible exegesis of the Sermon on the Mount. Context matters. So when you study the Bible, remember, context is always important. Context always matters. And so when you think of the context of Matthew 7 so far, it kind of makes you wonder what is happening. Because the context of Matthew 7, right before Jesus said these very things, ask, seek, knock, is what? Judgment. We studied these a a couple weeks back. So we were reminded that we need to remove the plank in our eye before we can ever help um, our brother or sister with the speck in their eye. In the In Matthew 7, the the verse right before where we started today says this, that with the same measure we judge, we shall be judged. This should remind us that one day we will stand before a holy God and give an account. In the type of life and the standard to which the Sermon of the Mount calls us to live up to should make you say, how can anyone live up to that? Well, we need help. We need grace. We need Christ. And the answer then is this. We seek. We knock. We ask. We should thank God for this connection because when you stand face to face with the glorious gospel of Jesus, you, we must feel undone and unworthy and we should ever be aware of our need and that we desperately, daily need grace and mercy. And again, here is the answer and the supply is always available. So we ask, we seek, We knock. So church, take Jesus at his word. Dr. Jones also said this, and this is on the screen, and this is really good, and it speaks to the things that we should be asking for, the things that we should be seeking, and the things that we should be knocking about. So this is what he said. It says this, Asking and seeking and knocking does not mean that if we ask for anything we like, we will get it. What it means is this. Ask for any of these things that are good for you. That is, for the salvation of your soul, conforming to Christ's likeness and ultimate perfection. Anything that brings you nearer to God and enlarges your life and is thoroughly good for you, and He will give it to you. He will give you things that are good for you. And the promise literally is this, that if we seek these good things, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the life of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, all these virtues and glories that we uh, were seen shining so brightly in the earthly life of Christ, He will give them to us. If we really want to be more like Him, and like all the saints, 
If we really ask for these things, we shall receive. If we seek them, we shall find them. And if we knock, the door shall be opened unto us. And we shall enter into their possession. The promise is that if we ask for good things, our Heavenly Father will give them to us. Let me finish with this. John Piper said this, Prayer causes things to happen that wouldn't happen if you didn't pray. Let me say that again. Prayer causes things to happen that wouldn't happen if you didn't pray. And you've got to remember that prayer is a human act. But it's a human act that God ordained and that He delights in. Because what? It reflects the dependence of His creatures upon Him. He has promised to respond to prayer and His response is just as contingent upon our prayer as our prayer is in accordance with His will. The Bible says that this is the confidence which we have before Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He will hear us. Now add that to what we just read. When we, will, when we ask, we'll receive. When we seek, we'll find. When you knock, the door shall be opened. And when we don't know how to pray according to God's will, but we desire it earnestly, the Bible says that the Spirit of God intercedes for us according to the will of God. In other words, He will see to it that those prayers are prayed which He has promised to respond to. So even your prayers are a gift from the one who works in us that which is pleasing in his sight. So we should be eager to spend much time in prayer with this promise. Ask. Seek. Knock. Let's not forfeit. Let's not give up any blessings because we don't ask, we don't seek, and we don't knock. Blessings for ourselves, for our families, for our church, for the nation, for our world. Ask, seek, and knock. Let's pray, church.